Festi fam, the time is now. Festival Goers unite. Welcome to the Festi Files, where we highlight the creatives and inspiring personalities that all collectively help bring the music festival experience to life. So if you're watching this at home and you attend music festivals, I'm talking about you because we all play a part in the experience. My name is Desmond Beristain. I'm the CEO and founder of Festi, the festival smart band. And today, ah, oh, today, we got, we got a legend in the house. This guy is a lifer in the music festival industry. He's a full-time musician, uh, music therapist since, what, age 25. He's performed and been associated with the legendary Woodstock 94, uh, Coachella. He was a tour director for the Star Wars Concert World Tour. He is also the director of production at AEG Live. Uh, and he's currently the festival director at Same World Entertainment, which provides organization and technical direction for countless festivals worldwide, such as Ultra Music Festival, Electric Zoo, uh, Electric Forest, and the list, the list honestly goes on and on. You know, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ron DeRoba. Ron, thanks for joining the Festi Podcast. Right on. Desmond, thanks for having me on. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So, uh you know, I probably missed a few things that, on that list, but uh, we'll just get into it. So forgive me for that. Um, all good. <laughs> it's I mean, shoot, where do we start, man? How are you during these times? Well, I mean, everybody's got to pivot because we've been told that we're no longer allowed to gather large groups of people. And so as somebody who has developed a career in gathering large groups of people, I've got to figure out how to pivot and what's next. So consulting still remains to be a, uh, you know, a good avenue for me, and I still continue to have that, but you know, the playing field has changed, and it's going to continue to change. And so right now, as we're all pivoting and trying to figure out what's next, uh, it started with the boredom that set in in day one of shelter at home in, uh, in, in Northern California, which was a week and a half earlier than everybody else. Yeah. And I didn't like being bored. I couldn't handle it. So I started to think, what, what do I do? I've got to find something else that is going to be valuable uh, in this current state for however long this may even take shape. So I developed a coalition um, and I titled it Change of Command. And in doing that, it really, it was a kind of a test model social media narrative that I put out knowing that everybody was going to be glued to their LinkedIn, their Instagram and their, and their Facebook and in, in, within my culture and my world. So I put the narrative out there and um, I had about 24 hours. I was never more busy having never more conversations about what it meant to possibly create a coalition because let's face it, we in the live events business, we are built for building, installing and striking things. It's what we do. So when, um, my first thoughts were, I live in San Francisco and Los Angeles and we have massive homeless problems. So my first thoughts were, okay, they're gonna need containment centers. They're gonna need COVID positive and COVID negative containment centers for the homeless. The right thing to do is get them contained early. And um, so that was what kind of sparked my interest. And then I work with an investment group that, uh, you know, why I say we used to gather people for a living and, and, and they would invest in those things. Now we're trying to pivot and figure out exactly what, what does that mean now? So that's four weeks in the making and where it's taken me over the course of the four weeks is that rather than respond to COVID-19, um, we're building it for the long haul. Yes. There'll be a time again when a coalition with a national database uh, that can be pinpointed to 100 and 200 mile radius um, s service providers, talent, uh, labor forces, uh, skilled and unskilled, union and non-union, project management, and all of the assets that go along with creating an emergency response in sanitizable flooring, ba barricade, security, catering, tents, all of the things we do at festivals. Uh, it's not a unique idea. Many organizations have banded together uh, since uh, this all started. We're all like-minded individuals and, and, and our organizations. So, you know, there's some really good work being done by Mountain Productions and really good work being done by Upstaging and Tate and 
and uh, all, you know, a lot of the asset based service providers mm -hmm. and then the thought based service providers um, kind of got together. We've talked a bunch and then, you know, but they're in a position to launch this for the sake of being able to try to keep their doors open. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a one man consulting machine that hires a lot of people, but there's a lot of our groups uh, and a lot of our asset based companies that are larger entities with the need for keeping their payroll and their assets working. So there's a lot of things underfoot right now in response to COVID-19, uh, the entertainment industry response uh, that uh, Joe Lewis company and Joey Gallagher and a few others have gotten together to do. They're doing great things. Ryan Cora, Cora events is doing great things with his assets and his brain and his mind and his people. And they went direct to you know, where the help was needed. They're, they're finding that the, the system of uh, FEMA and getting a SAM contract is, is a challenging one, but hospitals and governors were in desperate need. So there was, a, there was a direct line to be able to affect change. And a lot of that's taking place now. And since it's taking place now, and you know, that with the onset of uh, the um, George B. Johnson CEO just put together a group called uh, Live for Lives of a lot of different other uh, live event industry people and companies. So with all of these current immediate response components taking shape, I looked at it and said, that's their field of play right now, mm -hmm. where I and change of command would, will become valuable is when we can actually go into the state assemblies and I can actually lobby the governors and the mayors and give them the resources of all of these groups, as well as all of the database that we've collected over uh, the nation with 14 different national uh, uh, coordinators right now, our goal would be to, um, to pretty much build the database and then be the conduit, be the conduit for the sake of getting FEMA contracts and liabilities sorted out, helping in, uh, these individual organizations be put into play, not as a amalgamation of a lot of mercenaries all throughout the country but one-stop shop they feed us tell us what they want we then feed the database to them and say this is the assets this is the talent that are available in your regions mayor uh city council state assemblies and so it's kind of been put on a back burner and now we're trying you know now i'm a little bit um back to okay when they do let us out of the cage mm -hmm. what, are, what are we going to do so we're thinking about different collective gathering ideas and uh, how we're going to go about returning to gathering yeah it's going to be a long slow process returning to gathering yeah and, and we're uh, all gonna we we who gather people in close proximity are going to be the last to enable that to shake shape I, that's exactly what i was going to say i was going to say especially the whole music festival and event space community. Um, but it is something to applaud the proactiveness that is you know, dispersed throughout uh, the nation and beyond, right? We've all kind of looked within, taken that time for the quick self-reflection, but then stepped out and said, well, this is what we, what we need to do. Um, and not just for the right now, but for the future. So yeah. can you talk about how the landscape is is shifting you know we're, we're every day is a constant transition but what does this mean you know a year and a half from now for for the music festival industry that we all you know love that it brings a lot of joy to us and some people at home are you know they're going through ups and downs but maybe to shed some positive light on you know what we are going through changes collectively and we're going to be better off for it yeah i mean it's it's still too early to tell how soon we're all going to be able to legally gather because the liability factor and the insurance companies that have to insure our gatherings, boy, that's, that's starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. There is no precedent for the sake of being able to uh, write that book and how that's actually going to go down. So I, I don't even know how we're going to go about doing that yet. Yeah. I'm pulling a lot of insurance companies and different, um, entertainment entities to say, you know, and keeping kind of keeping abreast of what the plans will be. But right now where we are, are large scale promoters that have purchased contracts to, um, with, with any level of entertainment. And it's a continuous shuffle down the road until there's more information 
uh, of postponements and reschedulings. Yeah. But there's really no end in sight to that yet. Yeah. It's we so simply early. won't we won't know what that's gonna be like. And when we finally do get a chance to gather, how close are we gonna be allowed to be together? Mm-hmm. How physically close are we allowed to be together? What's gonna be the protocol? I mean, you know, there's so many layers. We in, in the festival layer, it's we build it from scratch and and so the how do you maintain and manage the proximity components in a festival on a concert touring level? Whole nother ball game when you're looking at multi-purpose arenas yeah. uh, that are going to start going back to their businesses of their sporting teams with no fans inside, mm-hmm. finding ways to protect their collective unique cocoon of their workers, their security staff, and the people that work within that organization. Um, before we let fans in the door, there's going to be, I mean, there's so many extra layers of how do we go about getting back together? Heat screens at the front doors, going to be a necessary reality. Um, sanitation, like no one has ever seen Mm -hmm. in terms of creating surfaces and protecting people. Um, that's going to take shape. All of those elements take extra time and money that aren't in budgets right now for putting on a concert or a festival. Yes. Right. Yeah, so we're, mo- we're modeling them, but well, we don't even know whether, when we're going to be allowed to create. Yeah. And uh, I mean, the thing is so much already goes into a festival, you know, before this, you know, this, this pandemic. So uh, maybe talk about that because I feel like right now, whether if you're a festival attendee at home, you know, and, and we're all doing this self-reflection and looking around and spending time and, and exploring online and, and itching to get back out there, I think it's important that we all raise our awareness in regards to what goes into a festival because collectively we can learn to appreciate it whenever we do get back out there, right? And we can raise that level of appreciation. So um, my mother used to provide security for large festivals and from the staffing, um, planning months ahead, right? Maybe even year ahead. Just talk about yeah. what really goes into preparing a large scale festival of like 50,000 or more people. Well, I mean, we built the Life is Beautiful Festival in downtown Las Vegas out of scratch. Uh, the founder of the festival pretty much uh, pitched his idea to a, uh, a financing entity and won and was able to, to create it. And from that point, it was okay, go. So what, what that was all about in an urban environment was the first things we did were to look at the space and determine how, where we can contain a festival in an urban environment. How do we, where are our fence lines? Where are our entrances? Where's our security checkpoints? Where and how are we going to handle the traffic flow inside these streets? And so, um, you know, that was one of my, my, my role as a principal architect and festival director at that festival at that time was to work on how do you build something from scratch creatively and all the other components were, um, that was the brand, that was the theme, but the physical infrastructure components are what make a festival, the, the space and the geography in which you go. Mm-hmm. When you look at a, um, when you look at a green field you, or you take a Coachella and, and it, it's an open area. All that stuff comes to the table and comes to the event in a, uh, in a timely fashion, in an orderly fashion, and we build it as we go uh, over the course of the two weeks preceding the event. And so that involves, in some cases, when you're talking about 50,000 people coming to a festival um, or 125,000 people coming to a festival, that requires a lot of infrastructure to build all of those elements. All the fencing, all the staging, all the um, uh, all the cabling, all of the um, all the tents, all of all of the elements that when somebody comes to a festival and the finished product, they see that stuff wasn't there three weeks ago. That stuff was brought in for the sake of being able to provide an environment, and then that stuff will be removed. Mm-hmm. So all of those uh, parts of the uh, of the infrastructure machine and the production and operations components. It's a substantial part of the festival model, which is different than the arena or stadium model, because there's already all that infrastructure in there. Festivals require all sorts of stuff that don't happen inside, of, you know, that, that you have to bring because they don't have, because it's an open air uh, space. Yeah. Yeah. So lots and lots and lots of extra um, layers 
when it comes to the festival environment. And I don't know. I mean, I think everybody understands that all that stuff wasn't there. These Ferris wheels weren't there. All this lighting wasn't there. These stages weren't there. And it's part of the energy that they like to experience is that the fact that this was built for them at that moment in time. Um, but it takes a lot of money and a lot of, a lot of operations to plan it, time it, and install it let alone strike it after everybody's gone. Yeah. Let alone keep it clean uh, in between nights. Let alone... Uh, just, think about, just think about like what, what happens overnight after a festival where everybody leaves. Yeah. They go to their campgrounds, they do their thing, they rage, they party. Well, there's a whole overnight crew swapping out everything yep. that needs to get swapped out. Yep. And that's something that we all... <laughs> some festivals, you know, we need to raise our, our, our consciousness in regards to the trail we leave behind, right? So although there is a team, although, you know, that that takes a ton of work and it starts immediately as soon as the festival ends that night to clean up and get ready for the next day, right? But we all should start raising that, being aware and throwing away our trash if possible because no one wants to dance and walk around on, on plastic bottles and cups and like, like that. And what goes into, because life is beautiful. I mean, done a phenomenal job and it's just been growing year by year how so in order to get that green light right let's say it takes so much to start the festival to get it going how do you make sure to how can you keep it going you know what i mean so that the next year that festival's around and the next year because sometimes you see a festival just you know disperse and it's not there anymore um but then other times you get a, a life is beautiful that is now become a staple festival for las vegas other than edc yeah it's a commitment in economics from the from the financing uh department of a festival often it's promoters uh in the case of life is beautiful it started out with a combination of promoter and uh and an angel investment but without that commitment of understanding that this is not just let's not just see if we can make this work one year let's you know so i mean ultimately in the in the consultations that i do to people that want to develop festivals or create them or in a, in a, in a, in a uh, one uh time period in my last five years i was uh I, I was tasked with ferreting out underperforming festivals and trying to turn them into profitability yes um so the pitching that to the investors and, and, and how we would go about turning them around having a brand already is a, is a plus uh executing it poorly is a bigger minus mm -hmm. so that was a hard sell but the the people that create them out of scratch, the life is beautiful. And, uh, you know, we, we, we um, Rehan Chowdhury and I, uh, we started a business a couple of years back um, after we left life is beautiful. And we developed a, an opportunity in uh, Phoenix and we partnered with Superfly. Okay. Yep. And, and uh, that was called lost Lake. And the challenges that go with this, you know, with, with, with putting a new brand on the map in an underserved market are, they're massive. It's hard, even when you have the, uh, the, uh, the, the wealth of experience and the infrastructure opportunities and the relationships that Lost Lake had, mm -hmm. it was still, sometimes it's just not worth it to, to go into year two. When you're a festival operator and you have multiple other brands like as they do, it's clearly a smart move. It was worth trying, but it was not worth maintaining. It's a hard business to try and um, to just dabble in. Yeah. We don't dabble. The people that produce, you know, uh, the large scale festivals across the world, they are not, they're not in it for the short haul. They're in it for the long haul and they're in it to try to develop their brands. And so the smartest thing that any festival uh, entity does is, um, is raise enough or raise enough or have enough capital to weather the brand building years because that's what you're really trying to do you're trying to appeal to a group of people that want to come to that space every year over year got it yeah it's a long, long time. Every, every successful festival has become its own brand by design and has put itself on its map and has developed its opportunities based upon wanting to be able to uh, continue to develop and grow and become larger so that you can start becoming profitable. 
because it's a long, slow road to get profitable in a festival. You got to spend way too much money on a festival yeah, to make money. Uh, can you share a story, if, you're, if possible, of a festival that was, you know, uh, on the border that you assisted and, and helped turn around in, in a positive direction? Uh, well, I could share stories of where I was going with that when we tried, but that was, um, that was the year that the fire festival happened. Oh, here we go. And so as a result of the fire festival, I, in five days, learned that I was no longer going to be able to get any investment in underperforming festival properties. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Ron, but our boards won't let us invest in these types of things. So no, <laughs> sadly, I can't share with you who, uh, who, who we were able to turn around because in a week, the whole world turned itself off, the whole financial world turned itself off of want, you know, wanting to get involved. Yeah, that was the domino. That, that part of it. That, that was, was a, a big domino effect. Yeah, that and Pemberton choosing not to, um, not to issue refunds in the same week really was a black eye for the festival market. Yeah, I unfortunately was left holding an empty bag and 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 did not have, didn't have the financing to continue on what I was tasked to do that year. Is that a real thing? I mean, yeah, we we are. This is. You know, real life stuff here, but the whole, and right now a lot of festivals are issuing refunds. Is this something that where a festival could say, shoot, we're too close to the official launch date and can't issue a refund? Because some of, there has been some controversy going around right now with some festivals saying, hey, we're, we're trying our best for, you know, maybe even offering credit for the future. Other festivals have refunded, but those are the larger festivals. But is it possible that these smaller festivals really aren't able to issue refunds? Uh, within 60 days of the festival. As irresponsible as it is to not have the ability to issue a refund, uh, yes, it's probably taking place. Because people want to try to develop a festival idea. They just try to figure out how they can be the next Electric Forest or how they can be the next Coachella. And their dreams are beautiful, but their business methods to get there are a suspect. And I'm not pointing anybody out in particular, but I'm saying that if you do not have the wherewithal and the financial responsibility to be able to weather whatever that potential storm may be, force majeure before we had a pandemic that affected mm -hmm. everybody was an act of God that could possibly fan cancel your festival. Mm -hmm. Something that was going to make it so that you were not going to be able to, to, to make it happen. Not irresponsibility, as in the case of the uh, you know, point, point blank, the, the fire festival, mm -hmm. but just simply an act of God that eliminated your ability. This pandemic changed that playing field because everybody was leveled out and no longer were gathering uh, in any way, shape, or form, and no end in sight as to when that will come back. Mm -hmm. So anybody that was really working on, it's unfortunate, anybody that was working on their building of, of launching a new festival, Boy, timing is awful. Yeah. Awful. Because nobody was going to be able to, to understand how that was going to work. But if you did not finance for the sake of being able to issue refunds, and if you were living off of ticket revenue to be able to play, pay guarantees and did not have enough money in the bank, I consider that to be unfortunate and irresponsible. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough, you know, because if you're an attendee, you're not thinking about all that at that point. You're thinking about, shoot, I committed X hundreds of dollars and you're you telling my money back. Yeah. And especially during you know these what? times. I don't have any money anymore. I don't have a yeah. job and I'm not going to get to go see the, the, what I wanted to go see. So can I have my money back, please? Yeah. And it's the right thing to do. Yeah. And now, ultimately, uh, with the um, with with not knowing when gatherings will be able to uh, reconvene. There is the other side of that coin that says, okay, um, we're gonna hold on to it because we're really trying to come back. We're really trying to make this thing happen in October. We're really trying to make this thing happen in September, October, November, whatever it is. And um, you know, stick with us, please, if you can. But over the course of the last two weeks, what we've seen in the concert industry is that there's a big backlash. Yeah, yep. From that, Ticketmaster just said, "Okay, fine, we'll 
militia refunds. Yeah. The initial, the initial reaction was, let us try to figure this out first. But as time went on and that the no end in sight factor continued, larger organizations that can do it um, do the right thing. Exactly. All right, cool. You got it. You're, well, here, here's your choice. We are not going anywhere. We will be your ticket uh, solution and your, 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 your concert promoter and your producer of, of these events in the future. You can either keep it in the kitty, if you can keep it in the kitty, or you can have your money back if you want. Yeah. Uh, and it's just an unprecedented type of, um, of a reaction that is our new reality. Do you believe that this will open up opportunities for, for new festivals to emerge? Or is it where, since this is such a big hit currently, right? And maybe it still is too early to tell, but is it where the larger festivals are just kind of gonna just maintain their, their stake and, and maybe even just take over more so? Or do you believe that there is gonna be opportunity for someone to emerge? Because one thing that is emerging is uh, virtual festivals, correct? So there's virtual festivals, um, obviously the live streams are going on, but uh, yeah, just talking about the landscape and opportunities ahead. I don't think there's going to be opportunity for newcomers to come into the space because in order to finance those things, you need, in, uh, you need a group that is not risk averse. Mm. Promoters are not risk averse. It's all, it's what they do. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're going to continue, but outside of the, the, the larger entities that finance them, festival events or singular concert events or other types of things along, uh, along the public gathering lines, it's going to be really hard to get somebody to want to invest in that gathering for an unproven brand mm -hmm. now more so than ever. Yeah. So I don't see a whole lot of, uh, you know, I don't see a whole lot of new emergence in new brands. I see uh, a comfort level in older brands, keeping people, giving them what they what they what they love and what they long for depending on when we are finally allowed to get back together and gather and they're going to maintain their space and grow and they'll, they'll be the ones that eventually will develop new brands and and then take on the ideas but i given the way this is all shaken down in the last month and the realities that you know the mayor of los angeles said no concert events until mm -hmm. 2021 we still don't know when we're going to be able to gather large groups of people for anything, whether that's a concert, a, a, a sporting event, yeah. or a conference. And with that level of uncertainty, I don't see anybody getting into the business game mm -hmm. of wanting to invest in it. There's too many other opportunities. Now you brought up virtual and other, other spaces where entertainment can be perpetuated in unique new ways. Yeah, I see lots of emerging um, talent coming out in the, uh, in, in, the, in the business landscape in those spaces. Mm -hmm. People, you know, like what Travis Scott just did with Fortnite. Yeah. That was awesome. People loved it. Yep. There will be more unique engagements to engage artists with their fan bases in ways that we weren't doing before in our new normal. And is the more creative that our, 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 our talent pool gets in producing concerts, producing events, producing live entertainment experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and the more creative that that entire body gets in developing a new experience, uh, that's our new normal now. Yeah. The thing, that, the thing that's been removed is the physical public gathering component of it all. But nightclubs online are now all of a sudden becoming okay, I can't go to the club, but I can at least experience the vibe and I'm going to do it. And yeah. so those things are happening. And, you know, there was talk about um, drive-in movie theaters. It's been, it's been kind of prevalent in the last couple of days. Um, there will be ways to gather people yeah. with the right proximity components and with the right experience. People desperately want this experience of shelter in place to end and they will rely on the creatives to help them get out of it. Yeah. And, and we just have to get good at figuring out how to do it within the rules. Exactly. And then find, was, and then find yeah. somebody to actually want to give us an insurance policy to let us do it. And being a creative yourself, 
I mean, the one thing about these, you know, the live streams and it's, it's great. And there's been donations, uh, you know, for artists and whatnot. But if you, the bottom line is if you are an artist and you need to generate an income right now, we still haven't really surfaced with a concrete uh, opportunity that generates the same type of income that, uh, you know, even a fraction of the income that these massive events and festivals uh, can, can do. So that I feel like is going to be the next piece that I'm sure everyone's actively trying to figure out. Maybe it's the exclusive access where you have to just pay to, to get in. It might, maybe some subscription model services uh, are going to start coming out too, right? Where you pay and then you get to see a certain lineup of artists uh, every month. So that's the innovation that the community has to kind of look at from all angles and, and formulate. And on every level. From the highest level of, uh, of talent earning to the, the struggling level of mm -hmm. uh, talent who wants to try to earn but isn't quite yet, but, yeah. has, but has a gift to give. It's a, it's, a, it's a game changer in the entertainment business. It's a game changer in the travel business. It's a game changer in every business. Yeah. Literally every single part of commerce in, 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 this, uh, in this world has been affected by this. Our roles in our own industries, uh, in the entertainment biz, is to figure out how to, one, stay afloat, mm -hmm. stay relevant, and two, continue to develop new ideas. And how do you right see now, fun? that's where everybody's going. Like, where, what new ideas can we all create to, uh, while we're waiting for the rules? Because we don't have the rules in the public gathering part yet. Mm -hmm. We don't even know what they look like yet. We're certainly putting our fingers on, on what they might involve, but we are not there yet. Yeah. So what do we do in the meantime? Because we won't be able to live to tell the tale another day if we don't figure something out for the here and now. Yeah. while we are sheltering in place what is our opportunity in vr what is our opportunity in streaming how can we engage and that goes to the brands too i mean ultimately that the, the brand associations that go along with uh, all types of entertainment events whether it's theater or concerts or festivals um they're in the same boat mm -hmm. how do how do they you know where do they replace that engagement activity that they used to have yeah. Television ads are one thing, but you still don't have the opportunity for those individuals who want your product to be able to do it in any real time engagement level. You everything is virtual and online now. Yeah. How do you, how do you engage with your with with your with your client base? So yeah, yeah. it's a the the if I have to say that the only fun thing about all this is that it's a it's a challenge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Getting innovative. I mean, even for us, we we uh, we built this product that helps people stay together and track their friends at events without the need of cell phone reception, and it's gotten a massive you know response in, in a great way. Uh, but now there aren't any festivals, so we're like, okay, well, let's figure out something else, another way to give back. So we have a couple of things in place, you know, starting with the podcast and pushing out our our online marketplace and 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 so much more. But yeah, you're right. It might even end up being where artists and it's not even about selling out but it might be where artists are signed to specific brands you know if, because you mentioned it these large uh, a lot of these festivals rely on brand activations right as, as a huge form of the revenue but without that you know, at, at least the part of the engagement for yeah. sure it yeah. enables it enables new activation opportunities and Maybe. the association factor that goes along with it uh, is important to the brand model but i mean but when you look at the entertainment business as a whole, we've all been in the live experiential marketing business now for quite some time. Mm -hmm. It's all been about that. It's mm -hmm. all been about the association and the brand experiences. So how do we return to, you know, the, the, the festival or the concert model was a, was a space in which we could all gather and celebrate all those things and enable opportunity for those levels of commerce with, with, with brands yeah. and, the consumer well now we have to figure out a whole nother way of engagement mm -hmm. we have a model we know it works when we're allowed to gather so how do we make it work when we're not allowed to gather exactly exactly we've got to figure it out because that's what we did for a living yeah whether we sold cars or whether we produced concerts yeah we'll talk so, about um, that i mean 
You have a, whew, you know, a, a very large resume when it comes to this. And you even mentioned music therapist. You know, I, I like that. Um, just over the years, what you've been involved with, what you've seen, maybe collectively you could share a couple, couple stories chrono, uh, chronologically throughout the times kind of leading up until now and, and why you're still, as you mentioned it, you're still finding ways to stay busy um, and, and you're still con you know, passionately and, and connected to the, the space. And I mean, shoot, for over 25 years, man, well, what's the secret? I, I'm a lifer. That's been my stock answer. I grew up with a guitar in my hands at the age of four and um, was I studied music all my life. I still play all the time. Uh, I spent some time in my uh, in my younger days before I got into the concert business as a uh, as a professional musician, and my day job was uh, as a music therapist. Mm. Uh, you know, I got tired of waiting tables to be my only source of income while I was struggling to do become a recording artist. Mm -hmm. I needed to immerse myself a little more in, in an environment that can, you know, maintain uh, all, music all the time. So I played music seven nights a week, uh, you know, whether it's uh, with different groups or uh, solo. And then my daytime thing turned into uh, working in a head trauma center uh, as a music therapist before there was really even a, a, a labeled field of music therapy. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I, I never got a chance to complete that because uh, there became a, uh, a very dedicated field of music therapy that became extremely popular right at a time when uh, I was going back to school for it. Wow. Uh, so at that same time, um, I was working as a recording artist and I, uh, and I made a record and somebody owned the name of the band. Huh. And Unbeknown, you know, like at that moment, I was no longer really quite involved in the business components of, uh, of that group. They were telling me you were going to you're, you're going to become a recording artist. Here's your, here's your record contract. I spent a year and a half making a record at Sigma Sound in Philly. I was on that path. I was on that bus, and um, that's when I started to work for the concert promoters. Mm -hmm. I had some really good mentors in this business of uh, of live event and, and, and concert events that brought me on board uh, with Woodstock 94 and then they took me under their wing and they enabled me some brilliant opportunities to, to, to grow that level of trade. Yeah. And I went in that direction because when somebody else owned the name of the band, despite having a proper record company that was putting that record out, I came back from Woodstock 94, having served as one of the travel coordinator stage managers at the South Stage under the direction of, um, some of the greatest promoters of all time uh, gathered for that particular event. And I said, all right, let me get this straight. Day job is throwing me some serious opportunity here. My new mentor in that space is, you know, it was, his name was Patrick Stansfield. He was going to take me out on the road with Neil Diamond, which I did for you know, five years for him. Oh, oh, oh. And that path was looking a hell of a lot better than, you mean we got to change the name of the band and you've got to pull 50,000 records off the shelves in the States and that's done. All right, I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I stopped and I just ran this, this route, the route of uh, live events. And I was a stage manager and a production manager. And I, um, I just continued to develop my opportunities uh, with touring and large scale events. So with, uh, with that, and under the auspices of, uh, of my mentors, I was able to be a part of some really big uh, international events and tour the world with Neil Diamond or Barbara Streisand. And it just kept on growing. So it became all I did. Mm -hmm. And I'd always been uh, intrigued and interested in large gatherings. My inspirations always came from large gatherings. As a matter of fact, you know, I, I was reading something that Harvey Goldsmith uh, is going to do a uh, a uh, you know, <clears throat> a uh, broadcast in the next couple of days, and there are some people looking at it like who was in the crowd in for Live Aid. This will be a Q and A with Harvey. I'm like, I was, yeah, I was that I, I was that kid in you know in 1985, I guess it was, in the crowd, and it inspired me to want to be a part of large gatherings. So I just continued to develop that 
uh, that that interest and that talent and that uh, and that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that's what brought me to where I am now. That's awesome. That's awesome. I feel like it's uh, super organic, you know. And I feel like even even for our company, like what made people gravitate towards Festi was, oh, this is made for festival goers by festival goers by people that have been in the crowd at during that amazing moment and look to the left and realize, Oh crap, my friends aren't here and then couldn't find them and everything changed. So, um, I mean, it's great to, that you, you're so deep rooted in the, in the industry and you know, it's very interesting because you know, the cold hard facts when we're looking at the current state of music festivals yet, you know, what, how do you remain positive and just say, I mean, this is, this is what it is, but we have to just find a way forward. You know, what's kind of that final message you have to, for the community that just said to rally everyone up because we're at home, we're watching and, you know, we, we all want to find a way to contribute in any which way we can. Do what you love. I mean, there is a big difference between people that don't have an opportunity to do what they love to do and people that seek out the opportunity to spend their time in a way that services them well and, 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 and feeds their soul and pays them money. But if, if, you, if you're only interested in making money, then any job is okay. Hmm. But if you're someone, in, especially in, in, within our uh, particular personality trait in our, in our environment, in our entertainment business, we're driven by the thing that is what we love. We're driven by the celebration of people. We're driven by um, the gathering of people, the, the sharing of uh, commonalities in music, in art, in our culture. And that's more meaningful with, with, with your time and your energy than making a paycheck if you can make that happen. Mm -hmm. It's not that easy. It's not for everybody. You've, but it, it's not always just about our industry. It just goes out to anybody who just who 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 just wants more out of life. Mm -hmm. Be focused on what makes you happy is how you can experience more out of life. And be open to the signs. I was open to signs. I looked at signs that said, "That ain't taking you anywhere anymore, Ron." Mm -hmm. So you're gonna put the guitar down and you're gonna go this direction. And let's see where that takes you at 22 or whatever it was. Yeah. And so, you know, don't be afraid of, uh, of taking risks. For sure. Life is, life is a series of risks. Hell, we're, we're all stuck in our houses so we can mitigate a risk. Yeah. Very true. And, and you mentioned something that was key. Like you followed your, your, your first passion and it's, I mean, it's still your, your passion, uh, as a, as a musician, um, same thing for me. I, I was playing professional basketball overseas, Philippines and Mexico. Wasn't getting paid that NBA money. And as I mentioned, it's not all about the money. But at the same time, I understood, look, this path, you've come a long way. You've defied a lot of odds. There's more out there for you. And kind of talk about that. Because for me, it wasn't just like a snap my fingers, okay, and just go. You know, and we actually have a, a saying, athletes die twice because <laughs> it's like when your career ends and then you know so kind of talk about that real quick because someone might be watching this and say well it's not that easy you know I think about it all the time and and but yeah I'm not but then if you're not getting at least finding some form of, of income or staying afloat or maybe that's just something that you have to decide on your own right you know I it doesn't always have to be about what you choose for your career or what you choose to make money I think first and foremost, we as human beings really need to learn as a collective whole how to serve ourselves and our mind and our spirits well by doing something we love. Turning it into a career, that's a bonus. That means that you have a really good, strong tether to being able to remain uh, a healthy and, um, and supportive human being on this planet mm -hmm. because you've been able to turn that passion and interest into a career but it doesn't have to be that it, what, what we all found when we were told to shelter in place and unemployment started to take shape and in, in, in the levels that it is mm -hmm. and the was 
how am I going to spend my time well now? We, every single human being on uh, now is thinking, what am I going to do with my time? Mm -hmm. Where do I put my energy? And yeah, we're often motivated by putting our energy into what our career experience may be because that's how, that's how we afford to live and keep roofs over our heads and feed children and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but first and foremost, it's still, you've got to be whole to yourself. And if you're at peace with that, you'll find the signs. Mm -hmm. I believe that's how I, you know, I, I followed. I, I, in my case, I had a little easier blueprint. It was kind of hard to deny the musical talent component and not run with it, mm -hmm. especially with, as a kid of the seventies, it was fun to do. Yeah. And so, but not everybody's blueprint gives them like that particular, you know, popcorn trail to follow. The popcorn trail to follow is what matters to me, the individual. Each of us has to ask ourselves that question. How do I, what makes me happy? Mm -hmm. If there's a way to make money at doing it, cool. But never lose sight of what makes you happy mm -hmm. because no matter how you make money, as long as you have what gives you peace and gives you energy and you can give back, you're you're functioning as you should as a human being. You're being good to yourself and you're being good to others as a result because you're at peace. Kind of goes for everybody. Yeah. And us being at home right now, you mentioned it, we're at home, we're, this is a time, self-reflection, you know, looking inwards, um, tapping into your creative side. And last question, Ed, what do music festivals mean to you? I love when people gather to celebrate anything. Music festivals are a, a manifestation of people gathering to celebrate what they love commonly. Now we've gotten to the opportunities where we can really kind of blur the lines and add all sorts of different musical genres in and add all sorts of culinary in and all sorts of other components in. But that gathering of individuals, they, is uh is the one key component that everybody experiences at that space so for me it's uh music festivals mean the opportunity for human beings to develop even better because they're sharing with each other that's what they mean to me so awesome. i want to be able to sh i want to be able to share again yes for sure we will we will Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you for joining us. Festive yeah, Files, Ron DeRobo. DeRobo, <laughs> Ron DeRobo, how do we stay connected with you? Because I'm sure this is, number one, educational on so many levels, you know, um, and inspiring. So how do we kind of stay connected to you? You mentioned mentorship role, um, anything like that, just even shooting you a thank you. What's the best way to, to stay in touch with you? Uh, you can, well, I mean, you, you personally or everyone in general? Uh, just in general, you know. <laughs> um, I mean, I, you know, I, so LinkedIn or Instagram are yeah. ways to connect anybody from a you know the, where we don't know each other to wanting to know each other. Yeah, and uh, they they work great. Cool, cool. You so know, Instagram, really and, the best ways. You know, I'm pretty. You know, I'm active in in those uh, spaces for the sake of being able to uh, share. Awesome, basically. There it is. Well, thanks for joining us. And, uh, you know, we'll Absolutely. see you soon. Thank you. Cheers. Cool, man. All right, Bessie Files, signing out. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Peace, love, unity, and respect.